So good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, I have the privilege in a moment to introduce you to a great friend of mine personally, and I know to many of you in the industry and Sharon McClafferty. Um, today's session is on the future is in, within your control, creating and capturing value, which is a really important point for many of you who are running accounting firms and looking at ways that you can better position yourself ultimately for the future. And the reason we asked Sharon to, to actually go through this with you is because we were at the AB Expo and she presented on this very topic. And it was simply outstanding that not only the content, but the aha moments within the clients or the people that were there listening. And this, the content that Sharon's put together is of tremendous value. And um, I just know that from today's session, you're going to walk away with some really good ideas, principles, and thoughts that you'll be able to take away and apply to your everyday practices. So Sharon, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Daniel. It's always a pleasure having you, and um, I'm looking forward to today. But just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, before we go on, if you want to ask any questions during the presentation, please feel free to do those through the Q&A. Now, I'll be moderating those, so I'll, I'll jump in and I'll ask the questions of, Tar of Sharon at the, at the right time. And then um, if not, we'll wait at the end and then we'll go through some of the questions at the end. So we'll do all that as we go through the presentation. In the meantime, I'm going to hand you over to Sharon. Sharon, you want to run with your presentation? Uh, absolutely. We might swing back to your, or can I invite you to do your little BGL intro with uh, who these gorgeous three people are? Yeah, look, um, we, we obviously BGL have been around for a long time. And I know that many of you are, are users of ours and some of you may not be users of ours, but I just want to give you just a really quick heads up about who BGL is. And as I said, BGL has been around since 1989 and um We've been through three reiterations of software from DOS, Windows, now to cloud, and we've pretty much rewritten all our software and positioned it for really great things that are, are coming forward in the future. We know that any great practice also require, requires great software. And I know, Sharon, that you'll agree with this, right? But it's not just about the software. It's also about the people behind the software. And it's also about the service and the experience that we deliver. And I'm really proud to say that at BGL, we're investing more in service and experience and in product than ever before because we understand the importance of delivering to you products that not only make a difference, but they're also accompanied by a service level and standard that you can rely on and trust. And just on the left there, I've got um, CAS360, which is our little Cassie there. And, um, you know, we have over 650,000 companies on CAS360 and over 110,000 trusts now um, since its inception in 2017. With Simple Fund 360, we're now sitting at almost 250,000 funds. And the way that Simple Fund 360 has progressed and developed, and now the high level of automation will ensure that your SMSF admin has never been simpler. And then our new person on the block is Simple Invest 360. And we haven't named this person or this little caricature yet, but um, Simple Invest 360 is designed for users to manage things like companies, um, partnerships, individuals and trusts when it comes to investments and investment registers. And I'm pretty excited to announce that we're almost ready to release the trust tax return. So that's... Okay, I've lost Daniel's audio. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump in, uh, just in case that's the case for everyone else as well. Uh, I'm hoping it's, yep, everyone else has lost Daniel too. So I know people at BGL will be running up the stairs to help Daniel out. In the meantime, um, I can jump forward. I mean, some of those numbers, the, the, the fact that BGL has been around since 1989 is uh, just incredible. And I learned so much from hanging out with those guys at various events about how they run a business. And uh, yes, yeah, so I think this topic today about things being within your control, they're an absolute standout uh, for running this business. Like some of those 650,000 companies, 110, like these are big numbers and they're run by people whose names we know, like, I love it. I'm a big fan. Uh, I'm a big fan of these people on, this, on the page as well. So this is my team or some of my team at Slipstream Group. So a little um, tiny background for those of you who don't know us. We've been around 
not since 89. Uh, I've been around since the 80s, uh, but <laughs> Slipstream has been around uh, since 2015. So we have five coaches. Uh, two big things that are different about us to, I guess, other coaching organisations, with the exception of the fact that we only work with accountants and financial planners. Uh, the first thing is that all of our coaches have owned, operated and successfully exited their own accounting and or financial planning firm. Uh, so we work with uh, standalone accounting firms, we work with multidisciplinary firms and we work with financial planners. Uh, and our coaches have literally sat in the seat of owning those businesses. Uh, and there's a reason why I like uh, I like to have coaches who are not still running that business. And I think COVID is a great example. If they had their own business, well, then that's the main game, right? They're going to run back to their main game. Uh, but luckily for us, uh, our coaches were fully focused on being on the sidelines of their clients' game. So that was um, sort of a proof point for us. The other big thing about working with us is uh, we have no minimum term, no notice to leave. We are a month to month agreement. The reason why people stay is because we're quite good uh, and we get really strong ROI. So it kind of just makes sense. Uh, for some of our larger firms, one of the coaches described it this morning as a very cheap insurance policy. Um, so we actually work uh, with 90 firms around Australia in an ongoing manner. Now those firms turn over anywhere between half a million and 8 million. Uh, and then the other thing that we do is business planning and we can help uh, people with business planning from complete pre-revenue, pre-name, uh, right up to about 10 mil. So we really only do ongoing coaching and business planning uh, in this business uh, and we absolutely love it. And today I'm gonna to share with you uh, some of the results that cross my desk every single day. And that's why we say, this is about the things that are within your control. I like, I'm so spoiled in that I see so many results from accounting firms. And I, I'm hoping that today I can prove that it's within your control just by plowing you with evidence. Um, but uh, there's a lot to do in a professional services firm. And I know you've probably had a really big month. Uh, we can boil down absolutely everything in your business into just two tasks. Now, I don't think this, I actually don't think this applies to BGL. I mean, you could probably apply this model to BGL, but it certainly applies to any professional services firm. So my business and yours. And that is the two tasks are creating value in the minds of your customers and clients and capturing those, that value. And almost everything in your inbox and almost everything on your desk is either one of those two things. It is either helping you create more value for your, for your clients or it is helping you capture more value for your business. Yeah, so let's build out this model a bit. Daniel, did you like, do you like this one? We got you back. Love this one. No, no, I'm here. So sorry about before my the actual Zoom link completely cut out to um, uh, log back in. I love this and I was so drawn to this, right? Because the creation of value is just something that underpins everything. And we don't place enough time or emphasis on actually creating that value. Yeah. So one of our coaches ran his business. Now his business was like a Swiss watch. It was beautiful. And he literally said at the start of every day, he said, what is on my desk right now to either create more value for my clients or capture more value for my business. And he said, it was the first thing he thought about every day. And the last thing he thought about every evening, how are we moving the needle? And when I talk about the needle, there's actually lots of things that can move on here. So I'll talk you through them. Uh, so this line is price and this line is the client's willingness to pay. So up here we have lost opportunity and down here we have cost. So the value that you create is the difference between zero and the client's willingness to pay. Now that's really important. It is not the difference between zero and the price. The value you create is the difference between nothing, sorry, uh, if you create no value, and the client's willingness to pay. Now the value that we capture is of course the difference between what it costs us to deliver and our price. So there's lots of moving elements on this pretty simple um, uh, model here. So we can move the price up, we can move the cost down, and the one that is very often forgotten is we can also move the client's willingness to pay. And there's loads of different ways that we can do all of those things, but essentially your whole business can exist within this model. Uh, and I like to think like, uh, when I first started speaking about this was at that expo and there were probably, I don't know, 
a hundred different um, booths that you could go to to talk to people about their product. And I like the idea of, well, before you go and talk to someone about their particular solution, it's a, it's a really nice idea to work out what, need, what bar that would move. What is this going to help me do? Uh, and so you can really hone in on the conversation. Well, is it going to help me with my efficiency or my people and reducing my cost to deliver? Or is it going to help me increase my pricing or my client's willingness to pay? Now, I do want to also talk about, uh, because we speak to so many firms, so we work with yeah, 90 ongoing, but we would here in this business, we would speak to, we have another 200 firms that go through business planning every year. And then we probably speak to another two or 300. Uh, and so there's a few things that I hear that uh, I, I hear something different to what, what they're actually trying to tell me. So one of those things that I hear is, we've got really high conversion rates, right? So we convert like all of our prospects, basically nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10. Now that's what they say, but what I hear is actually really, really big lost opportunity. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through why that is. Sharon, but then, but why then do we affiliate our success to conversion rates? We all do it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, People see value at the price that you're charging that, uh, you know, we have trustworthy written everywhere, right? That for me, if someone uh, converts, it says that they trust us and that we're worthy of their time. Uh, so, I mean, it's all those good, I'm sure it's kind of those caveman endorphins, right? Um, <laughs> but if you are converting 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, then, then here's the reality. Okay. So we've got five prospective clients and they're all going to buy the same service bundle. So it's all the same thing. Now, one client's willingness to pay is $2,000. Uh, the next client's willing to pay $3,000, uh, 4000 5000 6000 These are five different clients, very exact same service that you're offering, but their willingness to pay is different. Now, guess what? This sounds simple, but this is actually a reality. Your client's willingness to pay is different from the next client. So what does your price have to be in order to convert 100% all of these clients? Your price has to be $2,000, right? So in order to convert all of these clients, your price would need to be $2,000. Congratulations, you've just got $10,000 of revenue and you are now servicing five clients. Okay, if your price was $5,000, what would happen? you would get two of these clients. So your revenue is $10,000 and you now have to service two clients. And that's super simple, right? And you go, that's way too simplistic. Um, but that is like a lot of what we're doing at the moment for some firms is fixing this legacy issue. They charge two, they got everyone. And now they go, oh my gosh, I've got too many clients and too little revenue. <laughs> so, uh, so the other thing that's going on, if you're charging 5K and you're getting two out of five clients, 60% of your prospective clients are saying no based on price. Yeah, so that actually may feel less exciting, right? That doesn't, you don't get all the endorphins and you don't get that ego of, well, I'm trusted and respected. So it, it maybe it actually doesn't, feel as good as the five clients saying yes. But I tell you what, it's a much nicer business to run. <laughs> so it is just to be aware of, of the decisions you make and the control that you have. Yeah, so this is within your control. Now, let's say four out of five of these clients said no. Our reaction to that is usually our price is too high so rather than going oh you know i'm losing four out of five clients that i pitch to price rather than saying okay our price is too high how about a different question how about how do i increase my prospective clients willingness to pay for my service yeah so how do i increase that so there's lots of um, you know, understanding this model, you can ask yourself better quality questions to build a nicer business that allows you to have a better life. <laughs> uh, so back to this model, 
Uh, and I just, I don't want to spend too much time here because it feels very sort of 2011. Uh, but when I, uh, when I hear people that are time-based billing or there's, um, you know, there's cost to serve models, like what's my cost add 30% and that's, that's the price. What you're actually doing there is linking the cost line and the price line. So if you move your cost down in that model, the price line needs to move down with it. So if last year the job took 10 hours and you charged, you know, 200 bucks an hour and this year it takes six hours, you've just gone from a price of $2,000 to a price of $1,200 because you've invested in your processes, people, efficiency, cost to serve, right? Now, I know that's not how most people run time-based billing. They still charge 10 hours and they write up the rest. I get it. I get it. But I think that that model robs you of some of the quality questions that you could be asking in your business and robs you of a lever. And that lever is price. And I'm going to take you through how an accounting firm is, um, is using that lever uh, in a case study shortly. Uh, so this is a simple model, but it can be pretty big because you can say, well, where do I start? Yeah, where do I start with this model? I'm just going to wrap a few more, a bit more language around it so you can sort of think about where to start. Uh, I, I might just, uh, Deb's comment here, if you go with 2K clients, uh, they spread the word and you get more clients at a lower price and suddenly you have a lack of, yeah, it, it is a, um, at that lower end, it's a really unfortunate flywheel. Uh, so, and, and actually it's the same flywheel at the upper end because they all tell their friends as well. So no, there's a lot of reasons why you might go and, um, and change that if you've had that issue in the past. So here's a bit of language we're going to wrap around this model. So when we, I mean, we have, we do a lot with clients, but largely most of it can fall in these five categories. So people issues, process, product, price, and promotion. And depending on what you're looking to achieve, you're probably going to focus on one or two of these areas at a time. Uh, we find if people focus on more than two, then they focus on nothing. Uh, so that's some language to wrap around this. And I will also show you, uh, so we went and did some analysis on one of our groups and I'll talk you through where they're spending their time and focus and what their outcomes are. So Daniel asked me earlier, he said, oh, you're going to talk about the trends in accounting and blah, blah, blah. Absolutely not. So one, I just don't talk about that stuff. And two, um, the point of it being within your control is this is about focusing on your business, your client base, what you want in life and the decisions that you can make to get there. So um, I'm a bit of a shocker. I just, people say, oh, what's going on in the macro environment? Like none of us are huge. I don't imagine Deloitte is on this call. We can make our own luck, right? We have got a lot of control uh, over our own business and our own situation. Uh, so here they are. Now we work, we have a hybrid model. So we work um, in both group coaching situations and one-on-one. -on -one. So all of our clients have a one-on-one -on -one coach relationship and they are also in a group. Those groups are really carefully curated. So this is a group, uh, they're, they're accounting firms and they're about a million dollars in turnover. Now, I've got their numbers to, third, uh, to the end of March. So this is three quarters results versus three quarters results. And these guys have mostly been working with us for sort of 12 to 15 months. And I thought you might like to see, um, I thought you might like to see what they've been working on and what the results of those uh, actions and decisions have been. So I should mention that this profit line is after, uh, for these guys, it's 150K um, salary for the partners or partner. So we just like to standard that, standardize that salary. We don't really care what if everyone pays themselves, but in order to compare like with like, we put a notional salary of 150K per partner. Uh, we originally got that number because that's what the banks were using when they were valuing your businesses. So we thought, well, if that's the number the bank's using, then that's good enough for us. Uh, yes, business three profit is $9,000. That's right. 
So this, this is when they started working with us. And it's not uncommon, I'll be really honest, it's not uncommon that after paying part commercial wages for the partner, there's actually not a lot left. So these guys, their average pro profit margin after partner salaries was 15%. Uh, and as I said, their sort of average revenue for these firms is a million bucks. And that's spat out profit numbers. So for business number three, they had been operating as a break-even business for about 10 years. Daniel, do you uh, surprised by any of these? No, I'm not. No, ab absolutely not. And um, I think that as you dig a little bit deeper going forward into this, it all starts to make sense as to why these things happen. And that's that's really important. Um, okay. So I'll show you what happened here. So these guys... Um, for the nine months to the end of March this year, their average profit margin is 26%. So I think that's, I wrote down the actual number, it's about 72% profit margin increase. Uh, their revenue is up 26% average uh, for these firms. And I'll talk you through a case study of how that happens. Uh, and so their actual profit uh, is more than double because they're essentially getting a bigger margin on a bigger number. And the reality of that is, you know, their take home is significantly increased. Um, but I do want to show you what they focused on because we actually, we did this exercise internally. This, this is not something we put together to show anyone. So twice a year, we have coaching retreats where all five coaches, myself and our coaching team leader, go off to some beach location and the coaches show two case studies. They show a case study of a firm who's absolutely smashing it, like check out these numbers, here's what we've been working on, this is insane. And they show a case study of a firm that they're frustrated by. Uh, so we think this firm should be moving quicker than they are and I've done this, this, and I'm looking for you guys to help me, like what am I missing? Uh, and this is something that one of our coaches prepared on his group. This is actually not a high performing group within. So we've got 12 groups, I think, across our client base now. This is actually not, this is a pretty middle of the road kind of group, but he was doing this exercise to work out well, what of all of the things that we do at Slipstream in their first year, what had these firms focused on? And this is it. So uh, let's take that firm number three, right? So let's take those guys. Uh, they've gone from an EBIT margin of 2% to 26% within a year. And this is only the first nine months. So they'll, they'll actually smash this out for the last quarter. Uh, now, they're also the only firm in this group who actually focused on three areas and hustled. I'm not here to say that this happened by accident. These guys hustled. What actually happened was they had the wrong team on the field. Apart from the owner, and the very new manager who wasn't on the field or who basically it was their first day when they started working with us, no one else in that team remains. So this wasn't easy. Uh, they have replaced the entire team, but they had team members in this business for 10 years working in a break-even business, quite happy with that, no issue. The processes were, I mean, there were none. It's not that they were terrible. They were horrible. Like there was just no standard way of doing anything. Uh, and even their product, we basically had to strip that all apart and start again. So these guys focused on people, processes and product all in one year. Uh, and did, they did work faster than, they did work faster than, you know, other people in their group. Uh, and you can see what's happened there with their margins. Uh, and they're now like, this is, so early in their journey, these guys are going to absolutely smash it. Uh, but they couldn't smash it with the wrong team on the field. Like, uh, sometimes that's the case. I also wanna talk about this outlier because you'll see this is the only firm in the group who did not improve their margin. And they only focused on one thing. Uh, and it's not the case that these guys didn't hustle. The case here is that their people issues are at the very top. So, there is a succession process happening here. It's, um, it's, it's pretty carefully managed. Uh, the fact that we're able to add 130K revenue uplift is, is amazing given what's actually happening in this business. Uh, so our job here is to help a peaceful, 
respectful transition uh, of the shareholders here. Uh, and that's why I think their margin didn't move because they just, they have a singular focus. The, it is remarkable that their revenue lifted by as much as it did, to be honest. Um, and essentially we did that by bypassing the partners. So we, we had a project with one of the managers, uh, we deal with this with the partners and then we just did a project with the managers so that, um, so that they got that revenue lift. So it is within a singular team here. Sharon, yep. just a quick thing. That firm in column three, I'm back now. I've just had a couple of issues. My, my PC trying to keep going back to Wi-Fi. It's all fixed. But for the one that went through, you know, firm three, that example there, that it's that's tackled product process people at the same time. That is significant and deep change, right? How how do they navigate their way through that? And like, because it's not not easy, like letting go of a whole group of people, bringing new people, a group of people, and then changing all your processes and products to get to a, a point where you're better. So how do they? How do you how do you cope with such a magnitude of change? Uh, so two things in this firm. One, when they called us, and this is not, it's not all firms that we take on are at this point, but it's probably been a dozen in the last year. They called us and said, basically, I'm going to work with you guys. And if it doesn't work, I'm out. So we actually call this process uh, Love It or List It. Have you ever seen that TV show? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll renovate the firm such that it is saleable. And then you get to choose whether you want to sell it or not. So this, the leader of this business had had enough, like was working really big hours for not enough money and wasn't even eating what he killed. You know, like he was actually doing more work than his own profit and he would have been better off just sitting in his front room pumping out some returns. So, yeah, we did a love it or list it here. But this, the team thing is super interesting. So these guys did the yeah. business planning and they document this one-page business plan and it's, on A3 and it's got a ton on it. And then we actually show them how to roll that out to the team. So they rolled that business plan out to their existing team and essentially the team self-selected out. Yep. So in the same week as that business plan rolled out, the person that they were most worried about, so the person who they thought, you know, is gonna sit there and roll their eyes, she basically knocked on the partner's door and says, hey, I've been here for 10 years. I'm not really interested in change. Interesting, isn't it? And I'm out. So these guys, they actually didn't, um, everyone, they didn't fire anyone. There was one person, they probably turned the heat up on maybe 1%, like we now have expectations and KPIs. And they went, oh, don't want any of those, I'm out. Um, yeah, so this, I actually think the story there is that he'd had enough. And so he was a little bit kamikaze. How many people are in that, how many partners are in the team, um, Graham's asked? Uh, in business three. Uh, yes, one. And it's interesting how they sort of get to a certain point before they reach out that something has to be done and you don't have to get to that point. Things can be done well before that point. Yeah, but I do think it's a bit of the reason why they yeah. move so fast. Like hope is a really strong emotion. 100%. And so that love it or list it idea as in, I mean, he couldn't, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure he could have sold it uh, at a 2% margin, but it wouldn't have felt like he, you know, was selling his life's work here. So it was like, okay, let's, it, it's almost like, let's do a sprint. You've run the marathon, you've got one mile to go. <laughs> we're going to need a lot out of this last mile. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really good. Um, so the senior manager in this business has bought in. Uh, so he did actually end up, selling some of it but i don't think it's gonna sell any more of it because it is a rocket um i will take you through because i so they're the two outliers actually on this screen here right yeah. they're two uh points but i've got uh, a case study on this firm so these guys have gone from a 16 percent margin to a 25 percent margin uh their revenue uplift is pretty significant over this kind of reduced nine month time frame uh, and they've more than doubled their take-home profit, and they only did two things. And I actually think they only did one and a half. So they already had pretty good processes, right? Uh, they had documented quality processes. They just didn't have a team who was using them. So it was more about, okay, you have 70% of these quality processes. So one, we just need them to actually be implemented and used, and then we need to build out the remainder. So the processes wasn't a big thing. But pricing was huge. So they had an ideal client. And uh, because they're not, this firm has only been around for about five years, they had 
done that thing that we all probably are somewhat guilty of in our first five years of saying yes to everyone, <laughs> you know, and high-fiving every time we get the 2K client, which should have been 5K. So they actually had a bit of a legacy problem where they had the wrong pricing across most of their client base. Um, so I'll show you what happened there. Um, but before I do that, I've mentioned a few times this business planning workshop. Um, so yeah, we run these, uh, we're running a bunch right before the new financial year. That is not by accident. Like it's really good to get your planning done in June, yeah. July. Uh, it's super nice time frame to be able to show your team. This is what's coming. I think a big thing about these business plans is actually retaining quality team members. If I worked for any of you, I would need to know where the business is going in order to be motivated and stay on board. Um, like if you've got quality people, then they deserve to have a plan. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Sharon, one of the thing questions that came up um, was quite interesting is what, what we spoke about is where do, you, where do you find good staff? It's such a big challenge. Um, yeah, so it's a t I'm going to give some tough love here. Yep. Are you worthy of them? You know, like, do you, do, do you run a business that is worthy of new quality good stuff? And going back to what you were saying before, um, a lot of them, you know, when I looked at all those seven, eight firms, seven of them changed processes. Yeah, right. So meaning that maybe some of the processes and technology and systems they were using, just, you know, people wouldn't want to work within those if they wanted to bring new or better talent in. But the other side too is, is that, um, you know, I, I look at the whole, the whole you know, industry and I sort of say, well, why, is some, why would someone want to be attracted to you? And are we looking internally and asking ourselves the questions, what are we doing to better upskill and develop and grow our own people? I know there's a big focus external, but how about internal? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's a really good, sometimes us business owners have actually been in business and you're the same for actually a little bit too long and we haven't been true employees for a long time so I think it's a really good exercise to think about if I was going back into the market what would I want yeah and I would want a quality tech stack and a great website and wonderful clients to work with like I would want to know where the business stands I'd want access I'd actually want some transparency on if the business is performing um, so yeah I, I think that's a really quality thing but the other side of that is once you have good people <laughs> please treat them like volunteers, even though you're going to have to pay them, right? You're going to have to pay them good salaries, you're going to have, to have all the nice things, but they are volunteering because they could equally go to the accounting firm across the road. So trust me, you'll have to pay them, but you need to treat them like volunteers <laughs> uh, because we're grateful that they are lending part of their career to our business. Yep. I actually take that stuff super um I don't know, I'm from a family where like your career and your career ladder is like something that used to get spoken about at the dinner table when I was three. Uh, and so when someone comes to work here at Slipstream, I take that super seriously. <laughs> like agree. I'm one of, I'm going to be one of the rungs on their career ladder. And my job is to, you know, support them and have them leave on a higher rung than they started. And yeah, so the people thing is a real thing. Um, yeah, so I would... I think this helps. So we actually show our business plan. So I've got our recruitment down. Like it's, it's beautiful. I've been working on, that's one of the processes we've been working on for 18 months. So I get involved at the final interview and I show the candidate our business plan. Now our business plan has everything on it. Has Eva has everything. You don't have to have all that on yours, but to show a candidate, listen, this is where we're going. This is what's in it for you. You're actually now part of the team that put this plan together. Like, I want your feedback. Uh, and the thing is, like, it's hard to compete, right? If they're interviewing for three or four places, I'm the only one who showed the entire business plan. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, what are you connecting them to when you bring them in? Yeah. Um, so, okay, so people is tough, but they exist. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of unhappy people sitting in their cubicle right now. So we might just also need to get that inertia kind of happening. Um, oh, we put a promo code in for this. So you can use BGL for these events and get $200 off tickets. Uh, and what's included in those is a two-day business planning workshop, which is fully catered, uh, one-page plan template, 
a 60 page workbook. There's a networking dinner, so that's included. So booze it up because that um, bill hits me. Uh, and then a one-on-one -on -one follow up meeting with the coach. So you actually leave that workshop and a week later, you've got a one-on-one -on -one with the coach. And this pricing uh, case study I'm going to show you, some people have done that, like literally done the plan, had the one-on-one -on -one with the coach and off they've gone. Uh, so it's $2,000 plus GST per person. Uh, and there is a buy three and get one free deal. And then there's your $200 Fiji or promo code. Um, hilariously, though, we couldn't work out how how to apply the BGO code to the three plus one. So if you do buy three and get one free, you also get eight hundred dollars off. So that's just a win. Um. Sharon, just just a, a quick question that's come through from Peter Power, and then just a really, um, I suppose, good comment from Robert Lopez. Peter said, how much of the increase in revenue in these businesses during this period relates to extraordinary work related to COVID? Have you been able to, to, to break that down a little bit to sort of get a better composition of what the revenue made up of? So these businesses, that those numbers were really after the COVID, uh, as in it's the first nine months of this financial year. So there's not a lot of COVID stuff going on or extraordinary work. Um, most of that uplift uh, is either pricing uplift or some of it is charging for work that you're already doing for free. The amount of times we see people do real work for no money, like, oh, I'm just, I'm just going to host a multi-generational uh, meeting for this farming client because they're trying to work out some succession stuff. Oh, they're just coming in for half a day. And we say, well, how much do you charge? Oh, no, I don't charge anything because I write up the memo and send it to the lawyer and the lawyer charges them. So we do fix a bit of that. Um, so just then I just want to pass on this interesting comment from Robert. It says, I think most accountants like us are not short of clients. The main issue is staff productivity and compliance efficiency. The solution to this is technical, practical, and difficult. Advisory is easy because there is rarely a practical, functional, implementable solution. It's like a football coach telling his or her team to win by kicking more goals. Definitely correct, but sort of meaningless at the same time. As an accountant, I find giving clients advisory advice easy giving them practical solutions that work and can be implemented efficiently, much more difficult. Yeah, the, uh, we can look like legends if we just help people with pricing. But if you do it without fixing processes, which is much harder and more arduous work, then what you're doing is just moving one of those Correct. bars. And, and actually the cost bar, while you're focusing on that bar, the cost bar might actually creep up undoing any of that anyway. Correct. So the, the process stuff is really, um, you know, it's one of our coaches uses the phrase like swimming through cold custard. Uh, yep. That that actually can capture more value for your business than any of the other things. So uh, yeah, I I would love to say that all of this stuff is, you know, easy and rainbows and loll lollipops. It's not. And the big thing we do though, and the why I have the coaches we have is because if you're just telling people the what without the how, you don't get the results, right? So, yeah. so I have I had this stupid argument last week, whether we're coaches or consultants, and I was just like, I don't know. We're driven to help our clients get over financial performance. Yeah. And I know that's super cold, but that, that's really who we are. Um, okay, so I don't want I want to go on to this case study. And before I do that, though, I want to show you the power of the power of compounding. I feel like I'm a fin influencer. Um, so this is what process improvement looks like if you compound it, right? And some of this might be um, might not be process. It might be implementing some of the BGL stuff, right? But if you if what you're working on uh, if what you're working on is quality projects, they will actually have a long-term payoff, right? So the projects you do in the first quarter, projects one, two, three, continue paying off and you're adding additional projects. So people sort of say to me, oh, what do you do? We take what would otherwise take five years and get it done in two. That's actually what we do. And this is how we do it. We focus on the right projects and we get them completed such that their payoff factor is long-term. But it is a long, it, it is a longer game though, right? Because just when I just taking the cloud technology perspective, right? Um, we we're looking at what the effect of implementing cloud technology um, had on an accounting firm, right? Whether it would reduce time 
to complete a task or would it increase time? And what we actually found is in the first year, because of the amount of change you had to go through and the amount of you know, processes you had to put in place, it actually took more time to complete particular tasks. But then you didn't see the benefits till years two, three, four, five, six. And there, there, there is that, you know, that saying short-term pain, but there is a longer-term payoff. And that's what you're about. Oh, yeah. I watched, I mean, I've been around the Australian accounting industry since 2010. And before that, I was in the UK. Um, I've been around like in 2010, 2011, 2012, you know, through to 2014, the guys who didn't move to the cloud outperformed. Yep. So their profit margin outperformed the firms that moved to the cloud. Yes. And then it fell off a cliff. Yep. Yeah. And, and their businesses were basically not sustainable not valued very highly so there yeah there is a short there's actually a short-term gain of not doing things but what that means is selecting the right projects in the right sequence we often Correct. have people say oh i think i need to implement this and you go actually before you do that that's going to have a better payoff if you do this so yeah it's about that selection but i i totally agree i actually think um you could bury your head in the sand and have a really good six months 100 <laughs> percent um, okay, so this is a case study of that uh, one of the sort of middle of the road performers here. And I chose this case study because it's pretty simple in terms of what they did and what was within their control. Uh, and so their, a lot of their time was actually on this pricing piece. Uh, so they identified 620K of their revenue and clients that they needed, that they wanted to increase the fees for. And so that was 156 clients with an average spend per client of four grand. These guys were going kamikaze. So the, the background of this story is that they're working nights and weekends. Yeah, and just are not in a good place. And this is not a big business, right? So the background of the story is they were prepared to go kamikaze because they'd had enough. Um, so the sun's like about to hit my face. I'm about to just be amazing in here. Um, so they actually wanted to get their 156 clients down to 100 uh, and their average spend per client to seven and a half. Uh, we structure this project so carefully, like this is, I think, one of the most expensive projects to engage in trial and error. Like yeah. if you stuff up a repricing project, you can't just go back to the clients and go, sorry, I'm going to try that again. Uh, so you've got to be really careful with this. We have a, we have a really in process on this. So I just thought these guys went quick, right? So we decided to do this on the 1st of June. Five weeks later, their coach says, great, and we work, well, there's a lot of coach time with the client to get this done, but they have answers back from 30% of the clients. So they had 45 yeses and only one no at five weeks in. And, they, and four of the clients that actually said yes, they expected to say no. So suddenly our Excel spreadsheet is already out to the positive because there's $29,000 of fees we didn't, we didn't anticipate saying yes to. So the total uplift from the 45 clients was $111,000 or 43% up on their fees for those clients last year. Um, so $111,000 up on existing work for existing clients within five weeks. <laughs> totally within their control. Uh, and, and essentially what they're doing is fixing this, right? They originally stuffed this up and now they have to go back and fix it uh, in order to run a sustainable business. The other answer to the, you know, where do we find good staff? Well, you have to have a margin. You know what, you've got to have a margin so you can actually play the game. These guys didn't, they needed a senior accountant, they had enough work to mean they needed a senior accountant stat plus, you know, probably a grad net intermediary. They actually didn't have the margin to afford it. So because they'd stuffed this pricing up originally, they couldn't go out to the market and hire someone. Um, so this was 27th of July. The coach says you're 60% through. And at this stage, you have 89 yeses and four no's, up around 300 grand uh, on those 89 clients. And this is where it finished. So they started on the 1st of June. They finished on the 13th of October. Uh, the revenue on those clients went from 620 to 934. The client numbers we completely failed. So they went from 156 to 146. And it was a 60% uplift on the average client. And while they were doing this, all of their new client work that was coming through, and these guys are actually already pretty good at marketing, their new client work every time they repriced a client, they would push their new client price higher and higher and higher. Like every time a client said yes, they're like, right, let's charge that new client 20 instead of 12 and just see what happens. Joan, can so I ask you a question? Yep. 
for those that they had originally that were on 4,000 average, and they pushed them up by you know more than 50%. How did they do that? And obviously, how was it received? So it's a pretty, it's a really structured process. Uh, so we actually, we think, you know, you don't go practice on your clients. So there's, um, you know, everyone on the line is going to cringe at this word, but there is quite a bit of role play with the coach. The other thing is that we've done this for probably three or four dozen firms in the last year and a half. Uh, so we actually have this troubleshooting, like, Here's what the client might say, in which case, here's what you could say. So we've got all, we've been basically collecting troubleshooting data on this. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the feedback from all of our clients who go through this is they anticipated it being a lot harder than it was. They anticipated people being a lot more stroppy than they were. Um, even to the point where one client who was lifted from 10K per annum to 33 and this is not in this business but another business and of course this client was so scared about this meeting they're on the phone to us right before the meeting um the client paused like this really long pause and said i think this conversation was a few years overdue yeah like it's yeah so if anything people are surprised that the clients um are super receptive um yeah, and so these guys, the actual story here, given what we've spoken about already today, if you think about it, and if you if you're a capitalist and you're really harsh, they didn't go high enough. They didn't go high enough. I mean, it's a great result, and these guys have their weekends uh, back, and they've got their nights back, and they've got they've hired a senior and all that good stuff. But um, they are, like, if you are just looking at a spreadsheet, they definitely could have gone harder with their pricing. They have a really good product. Um, so yeah, that's these guys. But this is what it actually looks like because we, we track the financial data of every firm we work with. So this is what it really looks like in terms of revenue. The blue line there is their last year's revenue. Uh, so 2020, 20, 2021 versus 21, 22. Um, the orange line is their actual revenue. And then that purple line is the budget that we had set. So we're Nazis with budgeting. Uh, every firm we work with has a budget before the 1st of May that has been you know, seen by the coach. And um, yeah, so that's what that really looks like in terms of revenue. And this is what it looks like in terms of profit. It's pretty nice. Um, so, you know, this is just a normal family with kids and suddenly this is a real game changer, but more importantly that they've got profit and weekends. Um, and here's the real sort of budget data. So um, yeah, revenue year to date, all that good stuff. Um, Sean, just, just a couple of couple of quick questions before you go back on. Okay. Just Marcus came back and said the the four K just can't include financials, bass annual turn, and is this more complex groups not sold direct before small families? So so I suppose what we what we're getting at here is that these increases that have been applied, um, or this average that's been increased, what's the composition of the the businesses that they're dealing with? So I reckon if I gave away their uh, niche, I would give away the firm. Uh, but the interesting thing here, uh, we work with lots of firms who we help them develop a niche. Here, the reason why they were kind of looking to lose 50 clients is there's 50 clients who were quite simple and were not really uh, their ideal client level. And so I guess the reason they were happy to go kamikaze on those more simple clients is because they were happy if they left. So the story is that the simple clients went, yeah, yeah, I'm actually cool with that. Uh, but yes, the average, the average client there is a business. Uh, and these guys have a really quality product. You'll notice we spent no time with their product. Uh, they have a really quality product that they were, you know, charging what they thought was right for their original um, start in business but in reality they've now you know they're five years on and it's better off to have a better product uh, sorry uh, fix their product I'd like, I'd like to ask you a question too and before I ask you Peters how much did process improvement contribute to margins uh, it depends how far you go with it so yes. it's not enough to just to improve your processes um, but by you know improving your processes and documenting them and getting a better tech stack and all that if you can actually push a lot of the work down to non-professional staff so 
So just improving the processes is not enough. We then need to get the right work on the right desk. So we need the $110 an hour people doing $110 an hour work so that our $510 an hour people are doing $500 an hour work. So it, it's, a, it's a bigger picture than just fix our processes or fix our product. Um, but if you go the whole hog, then uh, it has a significant and measurable impact on your margin. 100%. So if you're scared to increase your prices, then I would suggest go read a bit more Warren Buffett. But if you're scared to increase your prices, then perhaps your focus does need to be on, you know, getting uh, better at processes, uh, implementing more tech, Becoming getting more right work on the right desk. Yeah. Um, another question here from Peter Power. Um, a lot of our clients are referrals from other clients, some extended family. So this strategy would have to be carefully executed as price differences could backfire. Absolutely. And price differences are something that we actually go and check before we even get near <laughs> this strategy. Like, so we, you know, the, it's, I, we often see that there's this two, you know, kind yeah. of two, two tier client base yep. and one tier is subsidizing the other. Yes. Yeah. So it's almost like, well, how long is that sustainable that we're going to have this, you know, these people are subsidizing these people kind of business. So yet yeah, that, that, um, uh, differences in pricing, absolutely, we need to acknowledge them. The other thing that we work on is actually we work with uh, maybe a forty percent of our client base are multidisciplinary firms. So you know, if you increase pricing in accounting and it throws off a planning, so yeah, this is a complex process. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, absolutely. I'll show you where you can actually download an introduction on Project Uplift, and you can kind of see it's a twelve step process because stuffing it up is really expensive. Not doing it is, is even more expensive, to be honest, like not doing it is really expensive, but but stuffing it up um, isn't, isn't something you wanna really mess around with. So I actually have something you can go download and you can sort of go, yeah, I understand how that works. Yep. Um, I think Jackie just put it in chat if you wanna go do that. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so I'm pretty much at the conclusion, Daniel. I just have uh, to say, we'd love to see you at business planning because this is where it all starts. Not a single firm we work with doesn't have a documented business plan, uh, us included, of course. And we have our, so our first three clients from 2015 are still with us. They're like BGL team members, Daniel. They're just never going to leave. Um, <laughs> uh, but those guys, one of them is back for their fourth round of business planning because they keep, they do one, they implement it. So in theory, they last three years. In reality, this business plan, if done really well, is only going to get you through two and a half. Yep. Um, but it makes all decision making easier. Like, where do I focus? Do I start here or start there? Like, you will walk out with complete clarity on where, you know, where is the focus and who's involved and how am I resourcing it and where are we going? Um, so, if you don't have a business plan, like, I cannot recommend this enough. And actually, Daniel is coming to the Melbourne one. So, if you want to fly into Melbourne, hang yeah, out with. <laughs> I am coming down to that one. So, that will be fantastic. Um, yeah, I just put this here. I don't think we need to go through it. But uh, and there's that project uplift. If you if you feel like you actually going, need to go focus on price, that's some case studies, some initial information that you can kind of jump into. Yeah. And look, what I take from this, Sharon, is there's you no. Know, as we wrap it up, there's no one particular formula. Every firm is different, and there's going to be some triggers going to be easier to pull than others, but we all have triggers that can be pulled to make a difference. Yeah, if anyone, I, I, I get quite annoyed with the concept of, um, you know, coaches or advisors or anyone saying, oh, we start everyone here and then we do it there. Because when we meet firms, we find all sorts of weird and wonderful issues. And so to say there's one, there is one bouncing ball that everyone needs to follow is completely off. We actually had someone come to us for this pricing work and they said, great, we want you to help us reprice our client base. Wonderful. And if we were kind of the you know, uh, just had a hammer and all we did is bang, then we would have gone, great, here's Uplift. What we discovered was he had a dodgy uncle that owned 40% of the business. So if we went and increased his prices and the value of his business, we exacerbated the biggest issue for that person. So for me, I just go, it's if you are thinking that there is just this one journey for everyone, 
then that's a really expensive way to do this. Like the first thing we did was got a shareholders agreement, made sure we bought out the dodgy uncle, then let's go. We've tripled the value of that business. But if we did it the other way, that's a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I all the time I'm reminded that you actually have to think really laterally around where is the best place to start, um, you know, and also commit. So if if we're going, you know, if we're going to implement BGL's latest next solution, well, let's not implement thirty percent of it. We're actually going to get the biggest payoff by doing that project properly, you know, training our team, having a champion internally, measuring it regularly. Um, yeah, so I do love this stuff, as you can see. <laughs> That's very true. Well, look, um, we don't have any other questions come through. Um, and look, just on behalf of BGL, Sharon, I just want to say thank you. Everything that you present is always done with passion and um, a really great sense of just wanting to help, especially accounting firms, just better themselves. And, and we love that about you. Um, every time you present, there's always something that you get out of it. But I, I just love that whole thing of, you know, people, prices, processes and stuff like that. And they're all things that we can change and well within our grasp. But I just think that at times we need one, an awareness of what needs to be changed, but then also some help with what needs to be changed. And that help that I know that you provide can be invaluable. So thank you. Thank you. So, so thank you, everyone, for giving up an hour in the, in May to, to be here. That's a really big deal. And thank you, Daniel, for coming up to me at Accountants Business Expo and going, you. <laughs> what <do> you do? <laughs> now, look, what I, what I like about what you do is that you present possibility, right? And, and I love that whole concept of possibility. And you do it by instilling a sense of belief in people that work with you to, 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 to let them know and reassure them that you can do it. And that's what I love about it. Yeah. Uh, oh, every single person on this phone call can do it. Absolutely. I, like there's no, I haven't, I would have had doubts five years ago, but I just have so much evidence now. So yeah yep. um Lovely. thank you so much thank you everyone we appreciate it we will send around a recording of the session so if you'd like to listen to that we, you can and we'll make that available but if you'd like to get along to sharon's um sessions please do so yes i will be at the melbourne one um i'm going to be a little bit late on the 24th sharon but that's all right um but i'm looking forward to being part of it too because i want to learn more about you and what you do and the challenges that you're faced with too so thanks for that opportunity sharon Thank you, Daniel. Bye, everyone. Ciao.